I believe the deputies reacted to the best that they could, and I don't believe it was excessive force. What happened to Michael was he was beaten and, and uh, beaten to death. That's what happened to Michael. In October 2007, an officer from the Orange County, California Sheriff's Department knocked on Frederick Lass's door and told him his son had died in a jail altercation. It, it was devastating. It, uh, I didn't know whether to, to just scream or cry or what to do. And I asked him how that it happened. And he said there was some sort of confrontation. I said, what do you mean by a confrontation? Michael Patrick Lass was living on the streets of Santa Ana when police stopped him for having an open container. At the time of his arrest, he was schizophrenic, bipolar, had a history of seizures, and was an alcoholic. After the officer figured out he had a similar ticket he hadn't appeared on in court, Michael was taken to jail. After pleading guilty, a judge sentenced him to five days. The day Michael would have been able to leave, he fell ill. One of the cellmates said he was acting funny. The cellmate reported it to one of the deputies, and the deputy asked him what his problem was. And he said he would like to see medical for some medical attention. The deputy ordered him out of his cell and told him to stand up against the wall. The deputy came out of his little station, got behind him and ordered Michael to walk back towards him. Well, as he walked backwards towards the deputy, he looked like this over his shoulder. And supposedly, that's a big no-no to look back to see where you're walking backwards to. The deputy grabbed him and threw him onto the cell floor. He wasn't fighting or anything and he was already in a contained area, locked in a contained area. Immediately there was a second deputy there, a third deputy, a fourth, a fifth, and on and on it went until there were so many deputies you couldn't count how many deputies were there. A handheld video from the Orange County Jail begins after the officers surround Michael. Get down! Stop resisting! We got Stop a, uh, resisting! Uh, one! Just one guy? <laughs> He was stunned nine times with a taser. That, that's documented nine times. Uh, I can remember viewing the film, and at one point in time, while they are beating him, Michael tells them, you're killing me. Literally, you're killing me. The amount of force used to control this individual, it was excessive in my eyes. Thomas Abdeef was the attorney for Frederick Lass and is a former Orange County police officer and investigator of 20 years. And this is not a situation in which Michael was just beaten. He was killed, beaten to death. With Mr. Abdeef's help, Frederick Lass sued the County of Orange as well as six deputies involved with the incident. There was no evidence that he was a violent individual. Didn't cause any problem in the courthouse, didn't cause any problem in transportation to the courthouse. During the trial, the lawyer for the county and deputies, Norman Watkins, argued that Michael was violently resisting. Michael was not resisting. He was not fighting with them. Here, there was passive resistance. In other words, he just refused to let them have his hands. Because we're going to keep you here until you start listening. Do you understand? <laughs> do you understand? Yes, I do. I Are you going to listen to us? Maybe. Thank you so much. It was respect. In addition to being shocked with a taser nine times, the autopsy commissioned by the county and performed in a neighboring county indicated multiple blunt impact injuries to the body involving the head, neck, torso, and extremities. I believe the deputies reacted to the best that they could, and I don't believe it was excessive force. Michael Kruger is the current captain of the jail where the incident occurred. Although he wasn't in charge in 2007, he agreed to review the case for us. There's a little more than just passive resistance. I think the deputies made um, strong attempts to get his hands and were trying to pull them out from underneath him. The, the ratio between deputies and deputy or staff and inmates is much higher on the inmate side. When we have disturbances or we have incidences of any kind, they become very critical very quickly. And so it's very important to make sure we have the appropriate response. We tried to get him under control. The deputies on scene tried to get him under control and that's when he started acting very bizarre, had an incredible amount of strength, kept resisting with them, 
and just would not calm down. No deputy ever said that they had a cut, a bruise, a scratch, anything from Michael. Michael had 54 separate contusions on his body and he was tased nine times. It's just not normal for, to do that in protective custody. We certainly believe that situations like this are avoidable. Hector Viagra is the executive director of the American Civil Liberties Union of Southern California. You should be able to expect that your bodily integrity will be respected in jail, that you won't have force applied to you if it's not necessary, uh, that if you're complying with the rules of the jail, um, that you won't be struck, uh, that you won't be tasered. Here you had a situation with an individual who was in jail for drunkenness. It was a five-day stay, and it ended in his death. And I think we all have to be concerned with a situation that, you know, very little can escalate into uh, a death. It often escalates because of over-incarceration of jails with people who have committed small crimes like Michael's. Here in the, in the case of Michael Lass, Part of the defense of the county was that deputies are vastly outnumbered in the jails. And so they have to be able to respond quickly and severely to ensure compliance. Uh, and it's that sort of hair trigger mentality that prevails in the jails that is of real concern. The county also pointed to their autopsy, which said Michael's cause of death was cardiac arrest caused by prolonged agitation and physical stress. Watkins argued that this wasn't brought on by the altercation with deputies, but by something called excited delirium. That was a defense that was used um, by our attorneys. I believe it's more of a medical diagnosis or a term that's used to describe a series of symptoms, agitation, extreme strength, uh, not feeling any kind of pain, things that might be recognized that may cause somebody um, to, for lack of a better word, kind of go out of control. It's a very strange conglomeration of symptoms agitation, unusual strength, erratic behavior, but most typically uh, it's used by police departments and then by uh, city attorneys and district attorneys defending against uh, charges of excessive force. Viagra also points out that excited delirium is a dubious disorder at best. It's not recognized by the American Psychiatric or American Medical Associations. They tasered him nine times. Every reputable organization that has looked at taser use has cited concerns with multiple repeated applications of a taser. Depending on how they're used, uh, who they're used against, how often they're used, they can become deadly weapons. I'm not aware that tasers are considered deadly weapons. The policy has changed. They're now a defensive tool. The deputies may not have been aware of how many times Mr. Lass was actually tased, but the whole idea was to get him under control or to get him so that we could actually control him better. He's under protective custody. Michael's in protective custody. He's in the county jail. The deputies are supposed to be protecting him, not killing him. In fall 2010, after a three-week trial, the jury decided that excessive force was not used, and the county and deputies were not liable for Michael's death. The deputies did win. They took the law into their own hands and killed him, literally killed him. A second independent autopsy commissioned by Frederick Glass was seen by jurors during the trial. The results were strikingly different from the autopsy commissioned by the county. In the county's version, Michael's death was an accident caused by cardiac arrest. In the independent version, Michael suffered a broken neck and died of a homicide. You never, you never get over it. I call him my son, I call him my, 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 my child, my kid. He was 27 years old. He's always your kid, no matter how old he is. And, and you took that away from me. I can't sleep at night. I very rarely sleep good at night. I lay up there every single night thinking about it. I used to get in my car and try to go to work and I couldn't go to work knowing what they had done to my son. Hey,